So the next thing that we're going to be doing, um, we're still six minutes away, so he may not quite be ready. Oh, they're waiting for us, actually. Oh, they so they're all queued up and ready to go. Then you know we might as well get Mike Simonson in here early because he always likes to run long. We love you, Mike. You know you run long. Will he run longer than Phil, though? That's the question. You know, in, in a death match of who runs over, I'm not sure who would win. Okay. So we will have him joining us in just a minute from the green room. So Mike, Simon, Mike Simmons. I keep confusing him and Mike Simonson's last names. I've been doing this since 2009. I have no excuse. Uh, Mike is uh, the director of Astronomers Without Borders, and we got to know each other as uh, refugees from the International Year of Astronomy. We were survivors who uh, are proud to say we kept our programs going beyond 2009. So, welcome to the Astronomy Cast, uh, not Astronomy Cast, the CosmoQuest 24 hour hangoutathon. Uh, that will last 32 straight hours. Uh, we're very glad that you could join us in our midnight slot here in the Central Time Zone. It's 10 p.m. there on the East Coast, uh, on the West Coast. Um, how's it going, Mike? <laughs> well, it's going fine for me. I can tell you guys are getting goofy already. How long have you been doing this now? We're in hour 13. Uh, really? Okay. Well, you only have uh, what uh, 19 more. Hours to yeah, go. Yeah, so. Joe pointed that out when I went downstairs for coffee. Yeah, like twenty four hours. And and I think part of what's going on is is my husband and one of my programmers is like dissecting the air conditioner and the window, and I heard they had the table saw going. I don't know what they're doing, but part of my brain is going, "Please don't set the house on fire. Please don't set the house on fire." <laughs> he goes, "I'm making it work." <laughs> <laughs> well, if they do it, it'll be a, uh, it'll wake you up. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so, so Mike, thank you so much for joining us. You and I have got to work on a lot of different and amazing projects across the years. We just uh, f finished the marathon that I'm sure was more of a marathon for you than it was for me. That was Global Astronomy Month. Yes. Um, can you tell our audience what it is that, that your program has been accomplishing and uh, then we can talk about the things we're working to accomplish together. Absolutely. Well, you know, Global Astronomy Month is one of the big things. That is actually, as, as you mentioned, we are both refugees and survivors. I like both of those terms from the International Year of Astronomy, which I, I think uh, having survived that I think is a little bit of a badge of honor. Um, and I ran the 100 Hours of Astronomy Cornerstone Project during that. So Global Astronomy Month is the legacy of that. That was uh, a, a gigantic project that engaged millions of people around the world in different, different uh, projects. And so someone got the bright idea, and I have to say it wasn't me because I, I'm still, you know, have a little PTSD from, uh, from, from IYA that uh, we expanded into a month. And, and so that is the most recent thing that we've survived. And, and I have some great pictures from that, too. If we, when we have time, I'll just flip through those if you want to show people what, uh, what everyone is doing around the world. Um, but while we're known for Global Astronomy Month, really we do a, a lot more than that. And the whole purpose of Astronomers Without Borders is to share what we have with each other in one large community it's based on astronomy, based on the fact that we all see in the same sky. Our motto is one people, one sky. <clears throat> so when I'm, for example, visiting, staying with my friends in Tehran, you know, it's exactly the same at night there. Uh, I see the same stars and it's horribly light polluted and uh, so we're all doing the same things and it's, it's worked really well to bring people together through a number of projects that I'll be glad to talk about in various things in more detail and show some ideas as we go. So, so Astronomers Without Borders, I, I think at least in recent weeks, uh, has been most well known for Global Astronomy Month. Um, during uh, the International Year of Astronomy, your 100 Hours of Astronomy was uh, certainly one of the programs that we all put vast amounts of effort into making sure it worked in the uh, around the world in what was it, 80 telescopes? 
Yes, that that was uh, um, Douglas. Uh, so, so here it's not even that late here, and I'm blanking on names. Well, that's because it's late in my life. I'm I've, I've started to forget everyone's name. Uh, everyone, as far as I'm concerned, everyone should have a lower third uh, below them all the time in real life. Uh, Douglas. Uh, well, he's at ESO. Douglas Pierce. Pierce, yes, Pierce. Pierce Price is it? I think. Yes. And <clears throat> yeah, and he's at Alma now, and uh, that was. Uh, that was a 24-hour webcast uh, from 80 observatories around the world, uh, live, and that so that was quite a production. And that was sort of they they did that at ESO live, and they have their own. And, and they hired a pro professional everything to pull it off. It was mm -hmm. beautifully done. Uh, we're much more of the cable TV version of that. Well, it's yeah. You guys, you're, you're a little bit more like. Uh, uh, Wayne's World, it looks like. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I, that's a little harsh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you know, you're sitting on a couch. You could be in the basement. We're in the attic. We went the other direction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And there is a teddy bear between you and in the background. It, it's the bear of charging. It, it, when we need to charge our Google Glass, we need something to put them on so that we don't end up piling our computers on oh, them. Is and the bear what, wears them. I see. That's what you guys are wearing there. Because Nicole's is a different color on one side, and I thought she had become a Borg. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. Is that I, I to the woman? They're like, well, we don't really think of it that way. I'm like, but I do. But I love seven yeah. and nine, so it's okay. It's it's Jerry Ryan. If you're out there somewhere, when someone you. accuses us of being a Borg, we take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, but but today you continue to do all sorts of different projects with Astronomers Without Borders. Um, I, I know my favorite is, I'm not sure if it's still a child project or if it's now growing into its own spin-off project, The World at Night. It's it's truly beautiful. And could you tell our audience a little bit about it? Sure. And if, you, if, you, if you're inclined towards bringing up their webcast or showing some of their pictures while I'm talking, I don't think anybody will mind. That's up to you. <clears throat> the World at Night, yeah, it really was our first project, and it was almost an accident that became that. I was uh, my best friend in uh, Iran, Babak Tafrashi, who is a what we call a landscape astrophotographer. It takes wide-angle views of the night sky with landmarks of various kinds in the foreground. <clears throat> was visiting, and I told him about uh, my idea for Astronomers Without Borders, and he said, well, That'll give me an opportunity to create this new project I've been thinking about. The World at Night now is a team of astrophotographers of this type from around the world who are really the top experts in, in this kind of thing. And there is a collection of, uh, oh, I don't know how many, it's at least 1,500 by now probably images taken around the world in some of the most amazing places on Earth and some very simple places. And uh, so it's, it's, you know, I can talk all night about it. If, if you really want to show people what it's about, you have to show the pictures. I'm sorry. I can talk a lot, but I can't describe these things. <laughs> She's working on it. <clears throat> okay. But, and now you mentioned uh, whether or not it's really independent. It's, it really is entirely independent now. It's just a technicality that it started as ours, but Babak runs it entirely himself and is responsible for everything that's happened in this project. And so, uh, and it, it will become its own project when, you know, it, it, at some point. Oops. So, Here we there go. we have something of it. I have this... some pictures here I could t show too because I'm, I'm setting up for screen sharing as well. So, I can do that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is atop the 2,540-meter-high Devastal Peak in Uttarakhand, northern India, the largest telescope in the country, 3.6-meter aperture, will soon open her eyes. The site has been nicknamed as DOT, or Devastal Optical Telescope. This is morning twilight view, and uh, it was captured by A.J. Talwar. Yeah, and the, the country is India, by the way. So What did I you, say? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you just read it, and it didn't. I don't think it said India, so in the caption. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> if if people couldn't guess by your 
by your description of it. You know, I can bring up some here as well. Uh, so let me. See, I did a lot of preparation, but not for that. But let's let's Ooh. get some things. This is one of my favorites. Wow. Yes, that one is. Uh, yeah. Now, <clears throat> I always have a problem with that. With this, are those going in the main window there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We can control yeah. what the audience sees. You can control what you see by clicking on the little boxes at the bottom. Gotcha. Oh, yes. I forget that. So it all, that's what has always confused me and did in the last Hangout I did. I had no idea what people were looking at. Nope. This is the type of image Sorry. I have fantasies of taking. Um, Someday there there is a thousand dollar lens involved. Oh. So if I ever get rich or write another article for Sky and Telescope, I'm buying that lens. Well, that yeah, that in a few years of very very long cold nights, uh, with a lot of practice, you'll get the hang of it. So this is just the most amazing field of view. Jeez. Oh, but there you go. Right there is your lesson on stellar, you know, how stars move throughout the sky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right there. Wow. In fact, I'm going to show you one recent picture that was taken by Bobak just for fun. And um, okay, now let me find the screen share thing here. The screen sharing uh, window doesn't hang around long, does it? Uh, if, you, yeah, if you hit the green... Oh, there it yeah. is. There, you got it. Wow. So this is Astronomers Lab Borders World Headquarters. Which, in other words, that's my deck. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm is not that telling... mountain you see? Well, it's, it's the end of a little uh, ridge. You know, it's not a... It's dramatic from this side. From the other side, it's just a big lump. It's beautiful. And there's a lake down below. So Bobak took this when he was here just a little while ago. Now, so so far we've we've mentioned that you do Global Astronomy Month with Astronomers Without Borders. You do the World at Night, which is now pretty much a sp a spin-off project. Um, you also have Star Peace. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> and and I know you've been to Iran several times. Oh yeah, I was just there a few months ago. I'll show you some pictures there. In fact, Star Peace is not our program, so uh, I don't want to give the impression that it is that, but that is also a partner program that we have done a lot with in uh, recent times. It's run by students primarily in Iran, and they started this as a way to have people uh, bring people together, the same idea as what we do, but to actually have physical star parties where they are together or in sight of each other. For example, there have been uh, star parties on the border uh, between India and Pakistan, which are not on the best of terms. And in that case, the, uh, the astronomers couldn't get their telescopes close enough to the border to uh, actually join each other, but they could see each other and talk to each other on the cell phone. And that's the idea of it, to bring, especially places like that, that have conflict. Because what, what we find is when we're doing the same thing in astronomy, and people to people, without the governments, going, I think of it as sort of going up into the sky and using that as a bridge to get to the other side of these borders, that there is no more barter. And so it's a fantastic project, and we have done uh, uh, Star Peace programs during Global Astronomy Month. Uh, that's been our part of it where we've had uh, 30 nights of star peace uh, is what it's called and it sort of moves around the world with people in uh, similar latitudes and therefore similar time zones um, talking with each other while they're doing the same thing star party is usually outreach that's what most of the world does so so what other projects do you do you have going with with uh, astronomers without borders well let me show you Okay, now let me bring up that screen share thing again. 
And uh, <clears throat> here's one that, uh, again, is a program that was developed by somebody else. It's now under Astronomers Without Borders. We, we are a, an umbrella organization quite often. So we uh, provide a place where programs that otherwise wouldn't be able to get going or really need the larger infrastructure and reach that we have uh, a, a chance to flourish. This is called Telescopes to Tanzania. And this is one of the few times when we're successful in actually sharing, directly sharing physical resources and knowledge in person. As you guys know, because you live on the internet, on the World Wide Web, we can do things there. Uh, it doesn't mean it's free, which is why we're all here right now, because yeah. you know it's, it, it still costs in labor and everything else. But we can get donations of telescopes all the time, but it, it, a telescope that might be worth $200 can cost $800 to ship halfway around the world. So it's very difficult. Now, Telescopes Tanzania was started by Chuck and Susan Reilly, retired pastors in Wisconsin. And they started with their church and their local uh, Racine Astronomy Society in, in Wisconsin. Um, and they actually go to Tanzania, and they've been working in the schools that are there. Now, this is a group of teachers using uh, Astronomers Lab Borders branded, actually, uh, solar eclipse or solar viewing glasses. And these, uh, let me bring that over here. And they are at a training session where they brought 80 teachers from around the country, Tanzania to Arusha, again in partnership with Galileo Teacher Training Program, another surviving program, a very successful one, uh, from the International Year of Astronomy. And uh, so they are all in training here, and let's see if I get to the right one here, yes. And here is Chuck himself with a group of people. They're using a Galileo scope, which is another legacy of the International Year of Astronomy teachers and some children that he's demonstrating to about optics. Now, these are from schools, rural schools and so on in a, in a poor country. And this is, they've never seen a telescope before for the most part. Um, they had to teach them how to use not only the astronomy software, but how to use computers because they didn't, some of them had never used a computer before. They have them in the school maybe, but uh, they don't have electricity all the time and they don't, they don't use them. Now here is Chuck in his celestial wizard outfit with planets and stars and so on, talking with some students and showing them some things on the laptop. And we actually, does my cursor show up on this? Yes, I think yes. it does. So Chuck here, you, you probably could figure out which one was Chuck. Um, <laughs> the one from Wisconsin, which here in Southern California, we can spot the uh, Northwesterners, as well, the uh, upper Midwesterners as well. They don't have tans. <clears throat> and uh, actually he took a sample of a telescope which is being provided, sourced directly by our uh, major supporter Celestron um, that is being branded for Astronomers Without Borders and he's got a sample of it there. We'll be selling this before too long. It's a great telescope but we'll be using it for projects like this as well. It's a, and I'll show that later as well. And then I think I have one more, yeah, and this is, oh this is one of those pictures that's worth many thousands of words. Uh, we, we all know what it's like to do outreach and show people um, Saturn or the moon through a telescope for the first time. This is a, a student in a school on Mount Meru, which is an isolated high mountain where um, I, I'm not sure that they have electricity there on a regular basis or if they have it at all. Um, but she's looking through a telescope, which is something she never would have seen the rest of her life, more than likely. And so the astronomy is being taught here as a gateway science. It's the gateway drug for science yes. in places where there is no real hope amongst most of the students that they'll ever be able to get involved in. And astronomy is, is just perfect for this type of thing. It's, you don't find too many, for example, you know, amateur microbiologists, well, not intentionally anyway, and uh, you don't find too many amateur atomic physicists who will admit to it. And the equipment is hard to come by, but, you know, they've got dark skies there. I mean, dark 
beyond our wildest imagination. And they're, they're kids. They, they have the same view of all of this that we do. So that, that smile, I think, says it all there. One, one of the most inspiring things I walked away from last year's International Astronomical Union meeting with was a spontaneous monologue from one of the South Africans. Um, he, he w we were in a session on, um, uh, they're, they're working to open various uh, offices related to the international, uh, related to the Office for Astronomy Development, and um, he stood up and he said, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, that many people say that in South Africa, uh, I'm paraphrasing him, in South Africa we shouldn't be spending our money on astronomy research because there are still people here who are starving every day. But if we used all of the money in South Africa that is currently being spent on astronomy to feed the people, we would only be able to feed the people for one meal. But if we take and we build the telescopes all across the country, where the telescopes are, there is sometimes water for the first time, electricity for the first time, and for the first time children can see hope in technology and see themselves in that future with technology. So I was actually out at, in the Karoo where they're doing that in South Africa, and it's true uh, that they have jobs for the people out there now in the towns. Uh, they have hungry astronomers <laughs> coming to them for, for lamb meat. <laughs> for the braai, um, and yeah, like I said, power and electricity and opportunities to do research, and so they're building all of these education programs uh, around the fact that they have these optical telescopes now um, and that they're building the square kilometer array there. Uh, so it's, it's a huge develop educational development, which is really uh, putting the money in that brain trust yeah. of their next generation. Right. Workforce development. We're changing the world one observatory at a time. Yeah, and, and this is one of the ways that um, CosmoQuest is also trying to help change the world. We, if you go to um, Astrosphere, um, we have an Amazon wish list. Um, so astrosphere.org slash donate. Um, and we're on that Amazon wish list. We have webcams identical to the one that I'm using to talk to you right now. And the reason we're trying to get these webcams isn't because we need another webcam. Good Lord, we have many different webcams floating around this house that we use for events like this. And we'll use all of them for an event like this. But we're working to also gather webcams that we can take and we can give to our contacts in the developing world. And we have a program that we want to work on with Galileo Teacher Training Program um, and with Astronomers Without Borders that will put these webcams in the hands of teachers and amateur astronomers so that we can do during the day teen science cafes where teenagers from all around the planet sit down at the same time. We get one science speaker in there and everyone can enjoy it at the same time. And the kids can talk back and correspond with the people who, who are presenting the science. And then we also want to continue to grow our ability to do virtual star parties. And I know, uh, Mike, you have someone that does a very different type of virtual star party for Astronomers Without Borders. Yeah. Well, it, first let me back up a little and say I was in the same session as you and I talked to that South African uh, after he spoke. And uh, actually he I, I still have the notes somewhere, and I don't think I've looked it up. I, he was reading from some statement, and I said, where can I get that? Because that's the most eloquent statement about the value of things like astronomy and other sciences that I've ever heard. Um, I was at also a uh, year and a half ago at the, the Office of Astronomy for Development, and they're always they always want to be clear that it's astronomy for development, not the development of astronomy, for exactly the reasons that you point out. Astronomy being used as a tool for development in the countries, a way to start uh, science programs, science education, the observatories uh, to give the professionals something that they can do as well. And the word that you used that has been applied here very early on when we started connecting amateur astronomers and others in, in countries that were very isolated, and this is before, it seems like the, uh, a long, must be a long time ago, the internet was not as developed, it was only a few years back. But 
the fact that they were connected with uh, astronomers in the United States and other places, uh, that they didn't have that sense of being alone, it, it, he said that it, it provides hope. I mean, this is a very simple thing. This is something we could hardly imagine how important that that could be. But the attitude is not the same in most of the world. They don't have the opportunities, and they don't view these things as something for them. Now, they're the hardcore amateur astronomers, but they don't even they aren't even connected with people in their own country sometimes. I know in uh, one of the Twan photographers went to Uganda and he met an amateur astronomer there who was doing outreach. He said he was the only amateur astronomer in the country. Well, I happen to know a couple others, but so he wasn't the only one. But he he there was no he there was no way for him to know that. And it was just a fluke. I happened to know it. So so once someone has food and shelter, there's more to life than just surviving, just managing to stay alive. And so astronomy works very, very well for that. Now, and and over and over the programs that we've worked on, we have pictures of camels with astronomy imagery mounted on their sides from, from the International Year of Astronomy. And yep. we know folks working in China to preserve dark skies. And we're building a global community of people who are learning and doing and reaching out to each other over the internet. And I love that it's through the internet that we're able to change lives uh, one login at a time, basically. That's right, and it, and it really does change lives. And so it's very important, and uh, the the things that we've done with CosmoQuest are very important. We, CosmoQuest has produced our, our Hangouts for us during Global Astronomy Month. It was, as it often is, well, let's see, what's a clean term I can use for this? Uh, it is basically a bit chaotic, and, and it always is. But it's very important, and those opportunities to uh, connect with other people and to do it in person are very important. I, in fact, I'll tell you about something we're doing with other partners. Really, almost everything we do is with partners of one kind or another, because we all, CosmoQuest, it has its thing, we have our thing, and when we work together we can do things that nobody else is doing, and that's that's the whole purpose. And that's why, you know, we, we're trying so hard to support you guys, because you help us do what we do, and it's all important, we're all in this together. Now, with uh, the, the, you had the virtual star party, and it is quite different, what Jean-Luc Amassi does, Dr. Jean-Luc Amassi is an astronomer in Rome, actually he lives south of Rome, but he works at the Rome Planetarium, and he is a great outreach person. He is, uh, you know, I've I've met him, and I would say even for an Italian, he's pretty effusive. You know, he's on the high end there, and enthusiastic, and and uh, he, he's really amazing. And what he does is he has an observatory with some great telescopes, and he operates these. And basically, the best way I can describe this is it's like being in the dome with him. He's talking to you. You can ask questions in the chat box, and he answers. And you might see the telescope move. You look at his desktop, see what's happening, and then he'll show a picture. And he's done th everything from he'll do a Messier marathon where people pop in and watch, you know, all during his night. And uh, I, he's done a live um, uh, eclipsing uh, uh, exoplanet. An ex uh, Exoplanet Transit. Yeah. He's done that live uh, this was a couple of years ago, I think, and, which I happened to mention in a talk I was giving one time, and I said at an amateur astronomy gathering, and I said, how many people here have ever seen an exoplanet transit? Well, one person raised his hand, but it was Jeff Marcy because he was another speaker. <laughs> I said, you don't count. <laughs> He's seen too many hundreds and, of them. And this is one of the really great things that's starting to happen. Peter Lake, who's our, our next guest, he's also transmitted through a, a Google Hangout, a exoplanet transient. And mm. what what's so cool with the ones that, that Astronomers Without Borders do is it's really kind of like hanging out in the dome with your cool uncle who's going to very patiently explain everything to you while you ooh and all with a little too much enthusiasm. And it's just that quiet, awesome patience going from object to object. Um, ours are just like, ooh, shiny, squirrel. Um, <laughs> it's a completely different thing. And, and you know what? Starboard. And it is. And yours is more like being at a dark sky star party 
with amateurs that have been around way too long. Yeah. Because everybody stands around their telescopes, and once a, once in a while somebody says, hey, anybody want to look at Jupiter? And everybody wanders over there and looks at it, and then they go back to chatting, you know. I mean, that it is so much like a real star party. <laughs> and your description of jean Lucas things is exactly right. I, I say that it's just the same except for sharing the coffee with each other because the Internet doesn't do that yet, but I'm sure Starbucks is working on it. We, we uh, need an API for coffee. That's right. <laughs> but otherwise, it's the same. And you know what's different about it? Here's the thing. Everybody's talking with each other. Ooh, that's neat. Oh, that's great. And they have screen names in the chat box. And then once in a while, somebody will say, where's everybody from? And you'll see Mongolia or Romania or it's people all over the world. And they're all hanging out in your uncle's observatory dome. Yeah. And so it really is a, a community thing that brings us together through this uh, in a very personal way that's, uh, again, I, I, unique to me. And, and so when you support CosmoQuest, um, this is the part where we point out the, the donation link below us, uh, cosmoquest.org slash donate. When you help support CosmoQuest, you're help supporting our entire community. The dollars you spend, yes, they're going to our group at SIUE. But the thing is, Mike knows that as long as I'm not sitting on an airplane, um, if he can grab my attention in my inbox of doom and death, um, once he has, once I find his email, he knows that I'll work to help him. And yes. uh, and this is what Skype is created for because Skype allows him to circumvent the inbox. <laughs> um, and I also know Michael help us. We, we are a community that share. We are a community that build each other up and help each other's programs survive. Uh, Mike has the human community on the ground all around the world. We have the virtual community and the technology. And we work to bridge the virtual and the real worlds together through our two programs. Um, we've made it up to, last I checked, 10000 almost $300. Um, Keep donating. <laughs> well, you're now you're now getting people watching in other parts of the world. Um, I hope some people in the Astronomers Without Borders community uh, from Asia and so on are, are tuning in, uh, who have the ability to donate online. That we don't always have the same tools yeah. for uh, spending our money, but uh, uh, you know, hopefully, you're reaching the new audiences. And we do. We're, in fact, we're. We, our community is larger outside of the United States. We're going to be working on that. But I think that I've always sort of focused on the lowest common denominator, you know, the, the countries in need. But this is where the resources are. And it is one community, and we're a community of organizations. We've mentioned Galileo Teacher Training Program. There's Universe Awareness, another uh, yeah. IWA yeah. legacy. Uh, the the, on the earth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yep, that's their Earth. Uh, there are others. We've got a new partnership program with Lux Cumbres Observatory, a global telescope network that we're going to be working on announcing uh, this summer. But I can say that it's actually a way of pairing, you know, the, the, the ultimate bringing uh, U.S. clubs together with clubs in other countries and using online telescopes for teaching and and. and one of the crazy the things, we share staff across all of our projects. Yes, that's true. We steal them from each other regularly. Because <laughs> uh, So, so uh, um, Ivy on, on Twitter, I'm not going to give away her actual name because I, I know she isn't always uh, um, public with her actual name, uh, is, is one of the staffers that works with us for 365 Days of Astronomy through Astrosphere. She also works uh, with um, the Yanawe people. Uh, Thelina gets shared among multiple projects as well. Um, we, we piecemeal come up. Um, we protect each other. One of the most amazing moments I, I got to witness where it went from despair to better um, was Last year at the Europlanet conference in uh, Madrid, we got word during the conference that a planetarium that one of uh, my colleagues works at got shut down. Doors chained shut. She had this existential crisis of, do I log on to our Facebook account and remove all the planetarium show announcements? Because <laughs> she had just lost her job and been locked out of her building while on a business trip to another city. 
And by the end of that conference, she'd gotten a job offer at another planetarium when folks realized, hey, there's this group of people who just got unemployed. Let's work to pick them back up and keep our community whole. And we do this for each other. Yes. Um, well, we're all in it together. None of us is big enough to do anywhere near what we can manage uh, and, and never will be you know, to meet all the opportunities and we'll never be able to do everything ourselves as well. And it's true, we've, we've worked together a lot. The community is not that big amongst those of us who run the different organizations. But uh, and that's, we work together and we, we sort of live and die together too. No, that, that's true. Um, so looking forward, um, what things do you have on your wish list of goals to accomplish? I know you like to dream big. It's one of the things I like about working with you. Oh yeah, I, I, I realize that um, you, you, know, you know that old saying uh, that started when I was younger, Nicole is not old enough to remember when this started and you probably aren't either, but <clears throat> yeah, she's just a little kid. So, but, uh, uh, which is, and it's probably still used, which is uh, think globally, act locally. Yeah, yeah, but, it is. But, you know, what we do is really kind we of, reverse. we do the reverse. We think locally and act globally because the things that we're doing in our local areas, we take them and expand them out to global. And one of the ways we do this, too, is by combining efforts in different places. So, for example, well, you know what, I'm going to bring this one up and show you. Pictures, pictures are always better, right? Okay. <clears throat> so. Oh, I love this oh, program. We did a learning yes. space episode with them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so my head has just turned into these two round halves here. And uh, <laughs> so you guys know what it is. And this is a, a touch of the universe. And we've been working with uh, Emilio Ortez uh, Gil in Spain for a while. On what's in the background is the uh, Sky in Your Hands uh, Planetarium program, and these are our tactile uh, facilities for the blind, the sight disabled. The planetarium program, that's really the planetarium dome in the back there, which is uh, what they can feel. And I'm actually I'm now uh, getting some some because I live in Southern California. And everybody here's an actor, so I got I got a couple actors to to record the English version. But this is one of the things that we're doing, but it isn't just it isn't just a matter of here because I know others that are doing this in Argentina and Brazil, in uh, northwestern US, and here in Southern California, and they don't know the others are doing it. They they've all invented it themselves. But they're the only ones doing it in their area because they're the ambitious ones who take the time to do it. But by doing this kind of a thing and bringing all of them together, and we have a, a, a group now that includes all the, the leaders from various places in this, uh, we can make a program that can get funding and get these things out to everybody. Now, this is, is independent. We're helping with distribution on this. But it's just, you know, we have a, a disabled um, uh, people's uh, program during Global Astronomy Month and throughout the year as well. And uh, just so that I can... Sometimes a little awkward doing. Okay, so here is a child at the planetarium uh, using this. So now, what other big things? Well, I mentioned this partnership with Las Cumbres, and that that's going to be a big announcement. Yeah. Uh, because that's really that's going to be the big program. It sort of brings together all the pieces that I wanted to with Galileo teacher training program and with online things. It'll involve schools and amateurs and uh, online educational uh, resources and online remotely operated telescopes as well. So this is one of those things that's just sort of all come together at once. Um, I mentioned we have a telescope coming out, you know, we're, we're raising money ourselves in those ways too, but I'm not going to go into that because we want people to give you money right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's cosmoquest.org slash donate. And, That's where uh, it is. All of us work together. And I, I feel like we have to give a shout out to Rosa Doran because we've been talking so much about programs that she's helped as a force of nature um, to keep moving forward. And what's kind of awesome is back during the International Year of Astronomy, uh, the world's economy collapsed just as we were starting our year. Exactly. And, 
the donations we were expecting never came. And so there were groups of us scattered around the world who said, insert all the expletives, we're just going to do this. We're just going to do this. And we're going to make it happen. We're going to pinch pennies. We're going to sleep on one another's sofas. I'm going to be sleeping on Rosa's sofa in a couple of weeks. And we built these lasting relationships that are allowing us to build these projects all around the planet, leaning on each other's networks, leaning on each other's support. And um, Rosa is another one of these people who uh, she's on the formal education side of things. And uh, we work with her through CosmoQuest as well. Exactly. And that's why when you donate to CosmoQuest, you help uh, Galileo teach your training program and you help astronomers without borders and you help many things. Um, so it, it really is important and it's really kind of a multiplier since we all work together and have for so long. Uh, do I have time to show some pictures from yep. around the world here? Let's do that. <clears throat> so I, I think to... we would run late so the 15 minutes after this is empty. Oh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> yes. You you figured we were Yeah, actually it was. So I'm on you figure we'll run late and you only allowed an extra fifteen minutes for me is the the ultimate blabbermouth? Well, yeah. <laughs> you should have done that for Phil too. Yeah, I oh, there you that go. one. <laughs> so here we have this so these are some pictures that have come in about Global Astronomy Month around the world. And, you know, what's always interesting when I show these, and you're right, I, you talked about the camel cart in India and so on. Most of the time you show these pictures of people doing things, and, and you can't tell where it is, except, you know, maybe there's a camel or, or they're wearing a sari or something else. So this is a, a programs at the uh, Ghana Planetarium and in Accra, and this is the uh, National Coordinator for Astronomers Without Borders in Ghana. Uh, Sarah and I can't. Uh, I'll get. It, I'll mangle, mangle her name if I if I try to Sarah to say it. So she's joined us on some hangouts in the past, I think. Yeah, she was on our gam uh, year gam ending uh, hangout, and some of the uh, things that they do there, and these should look familiar to everybody. Uh, this is a, it. Looks like a local football team for those of you in the United States. Soccer. That's soccer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And, she uh, totally, so, so I love how one of the things that we find working with international partners is sometimes a perfectly innocent sentence will lead to massive confusion. Like when I say I'm not wearing pants. Yeah, don't do that when you're around a Brit. <laughs> um, so so uh, during the Global Astronomy Month Roundup, Sarah said, and here's a girls football team. And my brain completely fell out for about 10 seconds there. <laughs> and no, it's a girls' soccer team. Yes. Just same language, different meaning. By the way, I want to point out how similar they are to us here because you see these kids doing this, and apparently this woman is the sun and so on. And just like you would find here, here, here is a father who is texting instead of paying attention to what his kids are doing. So Aww. similarities, you know, it's everywhere. And uh, <clears throat> This is still in Ghana. I don't know what this guy is doing, but he's obviously going to be a scientist. Oh, I know exactly what he's doing. It's, it's the depth perception um, test. If you close one eye and you try, let me grab two pencils. Right, let me show. I'm going to make Nicole do this one. Oh, great. So what you do is you put a pencil okay. in each hand. She, she's like, no, I'm not going to do it. I, I got it. <laughs> I'll do it too. We'll both do it. Um, so put a pencil Light. in each hand, and if you have both eyes open, it's very easy to touch the tips together. Okay, maybe not for me, but my right eye is kind of crap. Okay. So I can touch the tips together occasionally. Now if you close one eye, and I'll bring them completely away, close one eye, mm. keep that one eye closed, and now try and bring them together. Damn it. Oh crap, I can do it better. <laughs> I can't get him at all. <laughs> <laughs> you, just that you have a bad eye. Oh, that, kid, that little kid's kicking our butts. <laughs> but but so this is supposed to teach you about uh, depth oh. perception and the fact that you really do need two eyes to have good depth perception. Now I I have to admit um, my right eye has significantly worse vision than my left, which is 2020, and I don't wear glasses, so I'm fairly adapted to my body has learned to compensate. 
Nicole, whose eyes are both the same, is demonstrating that really to have good depth perception versus good kinesthetic spatial perception, which is what I have, <laughs> I have good kinesiology abilities. But that's what this kid is doing, and we now gave you way too much information and humiliated Nicole, which was, after all, the point of the evening. <laughs> well, success there anyway. <laughs> so, um, I have to move this out of the way so I can see. Yeah, it is there. Oh, you mentioned um, you mentioned Iran. I was just in Iran in December, actually at a star party on an island in the in the Hormuz Strait of the Persian Gulf, which is a very interesting place to be. <clears throat> and this is from uh, Passer Guide. You can see the uh, by the tomb of Cyrus the Great, uh, the founder of the uh, Persian Empire 2,500 years ago. And they're celebrating Global Astronomy Month here. And it is also the beginning of their new year because they, the Persian calendar begins at the moment of the vernal equinox. So it's the only one that's really kind of astronomy-based. <clears throat> And uh, so that is there. And, oh, you know, check this out. Okay, so there's an Astronomers Without Borders thing. They had a meeting there. And down here you'll see from astronomy to global peace. This is, they're using a picture that I took in, in one of our trips to Iran, and that is my wife being greeted at a girls' school there. And they, they sent this on Mother's Day. Oh wow! For her, and it's really actually one of her favorite uh, pictures. So, let me see. Now there is the picture, actually. Oh, that's beautiful. Can you tell which one is my wife? The one who can't keep the scarf on her head. So, okay, <laughs> back to astronomy. This is New Zealand, an exhibition that took place there for Global Astronomy Month. Uh, this was Sunday of Global Astronomy Month in Nicaragua. Uh, this is uh, Global Astronomy Month in Pakistan. And uh, some of the kids assembled there to take a look through the telescope. <clears throat> a gentleman taking a look. And more. And you can see... Uh, oh, a lot of uh, outreach going on. Nice picture. There, these are all from Karachi, the capital. And I love how the reactions of people to seeing through telescopes, no matter where you are, it's the same emotional response. It's absolutely the same. And, they, you know, there are people here doing the same thing 12 hours later yeah. or earlier. Exactly the same. This is uh, Global Astronomy Month and International Sidewalk Astronomy Night, which, you know, we work with the sidewalk astronomers, and so we get together with them, the Astronomical League of the Philippines, and they're doing some uh, outreach as well. Now you mentioned Starpiece, so this is a group from the uh, this uh, the Astronomical League of the Philippines. But down here they have the logo for Starpiece and another logo here, along with the Global Astronomy Month logo. This one here, I got a few pictures. I'll get to those in just a second. Of uh, can't rem I can't remember the name exactly, but it is a group in Vietnam, and so they were doing a star party with their neighbors over in Vietnam under the Star Peace banner, and Astronomers Without Borders, and, and all of that. And uh, Sunday at, uh, in the Philippines as well, and the end of the day in the, in the, in the Philippines, a nice tropical sunset. Now, so, now hmm? one thing that, that I'd like you to bring up um, as we go into overtime um, is you guys are building your own satellite. Well, again, this is a partner thing, and we're not the primary ones on this, but we do okay, have a part, part in it. Okay, you're building a satellite. Yes, we, we are supporting that. And uh, let me turn that off, so no, I'm not talking to an empty wall. So um, this is one of the members of our board, uh, Tim De Benedictus. He uh, owns and runs uh, Southern Stars, which creates the Sky Safari apps for Android and Apple devices. And it's his dream to have a satellite to put up a, uh, a nanosat or a, let's see. CanSat. Cube, CubeSat. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> CubeSat, sort of a standardized thing. It's used a lot. Um, it's a very small cube. I don't remember how big, but it's like this big, you know. 
And uh, and we're we're helping to support that. But Tim is an amazing person. He's going to accomplish it anyway. So this is a, a satellite that will be launched later this year by on a Falcon 9 from Cape Canaveral. And it will orbit the Earth for a few months, and it will have cameras on it so that you can uh, take pictures of the Earth from the satellite, and they'll be transmitted down. And also, it is broadcasting, we call them tweets, they're not really tweets because it's not Twitter, but very short messages. And this is for, for support pledges from a dollar up. Yeah. And so it's really every man's satellite, and it's there just for that particular purpose. I, I had one email from someone in, I think it was in Zambia, and he said, I have no way to, to pay money into this, to donate on Kickstarter or through PayPal or something, but I can't miss this. So I just said, you know, we'll buy you some tweets. I mean, we just did it. It's something that appeals to everybody. You can take pictures, you know, if you get lucky, you'll get a picture of your own country if you time it right. Uh, what we're going to do too, we've talked with Tim about doing programs with it because there will be a lot of spare time. So there are a lot of educational things we can do. You'll be able to see it when it goes by. Uh, schools, they'll be able to do something with it. And at the end of this, it's got a big balloon that's going to blow up. Uh, and because it's in low Earth orbit, that'll increase the drag and that'll bring it down out of orbit. So it's not another piece of trash floating up around up there endangering our astronauts. Envir uh, environmentally responsible in space. I like that. Exactly. And it's called SkyCube, and you guys can look that up too. Now, I was supposed to by now be able to announce something that also involves, well, it's not a satellite. Because, well, it is a satellite, but it's not orbiting around Earth. Uh, Astronomers Out Borders, basically, you know, we're a local organization. We work only on the planet Earth, but that's changing. And I'm sorry, Nicole, don't. <laughs> don't want to make Nicole spit her Chinese food out onto the <laughs> microphone. And uh, we, we have had our logos uh, bounced off the moon by radio, so we made it to the moon. But, but this coming week we'll have an announcement about another program that we're taking part in that is well beyond, and I can't say anything about it or government agents will come in here and drag me off screen and take me and away and beat me up. flash your memory. That's right. <laughs> but there will be an announcement about that within the week. So uh, th that one's really kind of huge, but I can't tell you about it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That's okay. <laughs> but I like how the Earth is simply provincial compared to whatever you have planned. Yes, exactly, exactly. But you know what's really interesting with this with this worldwide community is the fact that you just forget where people are. It it just it's so irrelevant with what we're doing. It just makes no difference at all, and mm -hmm. it, it's become completely second nature. You know, we worry about what you know if you're on in the west time zone or the east time zone. Well, this you know, Thalina, who's worked for us for a few years, he's, what, 13 hours different from here or something like that. So it's just a matter of uh, a nuisance with time, but otherwise it just doesn't doesn't matter. So, well, and, and I know you and I have, have ended up, we sleep on time zones that don't necessarily correspond to your normal nine to five job in the places that we live. I, I think I actually live in the Hawaiian time zone. I'm just physically located in the central time zone. And and it's because I I have with Astrosphere New Media staff spanning um, from central time zone all the way out to Indonesia with CosmoQuest. We have forum moderators that I talk to almost every day and you know who you are uh, mm -hmm. that, that are in Germany. and. And so as the world rotates, the people that we work with wake up and go to sleep, and it's so frustrating that the human body needs sleep. Um, yes. We're going to ignore the fact that it needs sleep for this particular cycle. Um, but it's, it's just a matter of 
we find ways to make it work. We find ways to build relationships that span the globe. Well, you know, the passion about astronomy uh, is far greater than uh, these these other smaller problems like human physiology. So yes. On, in a sense. <clears throat> now, I, from for, I've, I've spent lots of nights up and awake. I've seen a lot more sunrises uh, at the end of my night than than at the beginning of my day. But I still wouldn't try and stay up for 32 hours and do it, huh? <laughs> let people watch it's, me. <laughs> we have very good coffee. Yes, we do. Um, so, so we're doing this. We were originally going to do just 24 hours, um, because we we were uh, we took a page from the Skeptics Guide to the Universe and the fundraiser they did. But we ended up expanding it out because so many people said, "Hey, can I come on? Can I be a part of what you're doing?" And we were able to fill those 32 hours. And we will, at various points, each of us take breaks. Um, but we're astronomers. It, your first night at the dome, you drive out there and then you force yourself to stay awake the entire night so that you can be on the telescope. I know, you were strictly radio. You never had to do no, that. No, no, no. My story is my first time on the Green Bank Telescope. I uh, was doing homework all day, showed up at the telescope at night, and then had a 24-hour run starting then because radio telescopes don't care about the sun. Right. So I've, I've, I've done this. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah, it's it's one of these things where, and my programmers and I have more than once um, pulled all nighters going into code reviews, going into uh, launches of new software. Um, one of the more terrifying things that I was told as an undergrad was when I got accepted into the University of Texas. Uh, Professor Stein called me into his office and sat me down to give me fatherly advice of you really need to learn how to sleep less and I thought he was oh, a crazy boy. man because I was president of the Society of Physics students I was working 39 hours a week or 29 hours a week not 39 that would have been insane 29 hours a week carrying an honors class load um, all these different things I did student government and I was like, sleep less. I'm sleeping five, six hours a night. And he was right. I needed to learn how to sleep less. That's how you get through grad school. Yeah. <laughs> and then it only gets worse when you have to start writing the grants. Welcome to the welcome to the big leagues. <laughs> yes, exactly. I find Benadryl lets me sleep for four hour chunks very well. <laughs> well, I you allies. know I, I I was an amateur astronomer. I was an amateur astronomer, am an amateur astronomer, but have been an amateur astronomer my whole life. <clears throat> and uh, I, I first deprived myself of sleep when I was probably about 10 or 11, when I understood that Mercury would be visible in the morning. Mm. So I got up at, you know, 4 o'clock or something like that and uh, woke everybody up wondering what the heck I was doing, which I didn't know what I was doing because I had no idea where to look. I don't know what I expected expected to see, but so I've deprived myself of sleep for quite a long time, which might explain some of my eccentricities. Permanent brain damage. Your perhaps. brain's eventually rebelling. Yeah, that's right. But I, I tend to sleep when I need to now. Um, but, I, it, but I end up having to work, you know, 24 hours a day otherwise. So, uh, oh, let's see. I can, uh, here we go. I've got some other slides here that I can show you, ask about different projects and things that we have. And here's how the community works. So let me, uh, this is just going to come up from a PowerPoint presentation I did and last And while he's night. pulling that up, we want to do a new plug out. Um, if you want to help grow the things that we're talking about, if you want to help grow our community, um, one of the reasons we don't sleep is we're understaffed. One of the reasons we're understaffed is we're underfunded. Um, one of the reasons we keep doing it anyways is because we love what we do. Help us to keep doing what we love and let us help you love it as well. Uh, donate at CosmoQuest.org. We will bring you the science. The full link is CosmoQuest.org slash donate. Um, every dollar helps. Um, Twelve fifty an hour to hire a student, uh, teacher professional development workshop. It's two hundred dollars for all the materials that we give to the teachers. Um, 
$200,000 is what it takes to do everything we do for six months. And um, if, we'd love your help. If you've already donated or, or, or can't donate at this time, share, share the link. Uh, share it to your networks, your friends. Uh, share it to your favorite geeky celebrity. See if they'll retweet it for us. Um, we, we could use the shares. Uh, that, that means a lot to us. So, so keep doing that. CosmoQuest.org slash donate. Uh, and also uh, the blue bar up there gives you the schedule and the links to where people can watch. So be sure to share that as well. Yeah, what they said. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important. If you're watching this, I mean, this is sort of like public television. If you're watching this, then it's important to you. So you should be doing what you can, even if it's just sharing it with other people. And uh, I can tell you, as, as needy as uh, public television is, CosmoQuest and Astronomers Without Borders and the rest of us are a lot needier. Yeah. Needy CosmoQuest, needier than NPR. <laughs> <laughs> That's getting tweeted. <laughs> okay. That's a very good one. We still love NPR. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, let's see. Okay, so here's a here's something I brought up. It's just uh, basically, not basically, actually, that is our our homepage. But with the the menu drop down to show some of the projects, you can't see that, can you? It's a bit tiny. <laughs> it's a bit tiny. Okay. Well, we have. Um, I'll talk from it, I guess, then. Sure. Uh, one of the things on there, uh, right about here, take my word for it, is Astro Arts. This is a very growing program. It turns out, well, let's see, one of, our, one of the people involved in Astronomers Without Borders said, you know, I've, I've published a book of astro poetry, and I'd like to do an astro poetry blog. And I said, okay, that's not going to hurt anything. And that's turned out to be extraordinarily popular. I mean, there are astro poets crawling out of the woodwork in yeah. all kinds of places, and Romania turns out to be a hotbed of astro poetry. Wow! Who knew? Um, and Daniela De Paulus, who's a, an artist who who uh, is doing some pretty amazing things involved with space and, and astronomy, is sharing that and bringing in all kinds of uh, other artists for programs that. Pamela knows well because they were on our hangouts during Global Astronomy Month. Um, let's see, ones that I would want to mention, well, we've sort of gone through a lot of these things. A lot of them are observing activities, and it's really a community thing where we have people who are um, uh, all observing, for example, Jupiter or something else, and they share what it is that they're doing. And in fact, I'm going to bring up something about the sharing. Um, okay, let me, sorry, this is... Uh, this is unplanned, so it's taking a little bit longer than we would have wanted. Not the smoothest. And I don't think this is going to show up very well either, but let's do it. So all the members, which is individuals and clubs, get a, a blog where they can share things that they're doing. So this one is uh, titled School Astronomy Clubs in Morocco. And uh, there's some very cool pictures of what people are doing in Morocco there. Um, so it really is a, a community and uh, people get to know each other and are able to share things. And what we have planned for the future, the very near future, is upgrades to the website that are going to allow us to do more of this kind of a thing. But again, you know, these are the things that bring us all together. That is the three of us and all the other people that are uh, able to act silly without everybody watching them, like, like with us. And uh, because we don't do these things alone, you know, the, the, the blog is one way of sharing, but the Hangouts and the other things that are done online by CosmoQuest is another way. And we, we, we don't do that. And CosmoQuest you know, helps us bring those, those uh, people together to help support our community, just like the others do. And we support CosmoQuest by getting the word out to other places through our, our global network. Awesome. We have a couple comments. Uh, Morgan Gordon only manages to get two to three hours of sleep a night if an astronomer wants to adopt him or her. Sorry, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and Tom Stratiker says he can donate time, and time is, is helpful. Time means sharing. Time means doing citizen science, and so we love that as well. So thank you. Absolutely. 
It's absolutely true, and you know what? Astronomers Without Borders, just like CosmoQuest, I'm sure, has managed to do an enormous amount with very little fun. Mm -hmm. In fact, pretty close to zero uh, up until now. And it's done through volunteers. But, you know, people don't realize that it's not just a matter of getting a bunch of volunteers together and doing stuff. The volunteers actually take more management than paid staff. And so somebody has to be doing the work of organizing these things. So CosmoQuest is going to have a lot of volunteers who are going to help out. We have volunteers all over too. But it, it, it's not free. It's a huge resource. But it's like having, you know, nuclear energy. You don't let it go wherever it wants, you know. So these things have to be controlled to a certain extent. And it does cost money. And, uh, but he's absolutely right. There are so many different ways people can contribute in that, that manner. And that's the greatest resource we have is, is amateur astronomers around the world. People are passionate about it. We don't need as many rich people, but we need them too, you know. So, <laughs> so if you're passionate volunteer and if you're watching and you're rich give the money <laughs> or even if you're not rich give a little bit so on on that note I think it's time to invite in Peter Lake uh, he is uh, one of the folks behind I tell he's coming to us from Australia hmm. and uh, Mike it's fabulous having you on as always you're just a joy to work with even if you do always run long but we program <laughs> well you you scheduled the time, and I'm going out right on time. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but that's because you control it. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much. Great. Pleasure to be here. Good luck with everything. I hope everybody Thank uh, you. gives. All Thank right. you, Mike. It's good to see you again. Great to see you guys. Good night. Good night.